morning, everybody. How you doing? That's a far better first response than I normally get when I ask that question. Good job this morning. It's a bright, sunshiny day. It wasn't when I got dressed this morning, so I got a sweater on. It was cold and rainy when I left the house this morning, but hey, it is what it is. Uh, as you heard, we are continuing the series, Destined for the Cross, uh, that Nathan started last week, and today I get to speak. I'm, we'll be talking about the justice of God. I guess a subtitle for the message could be, Why Did Jesus Have to Die on the Cross? anyways. Why did he have to die? Uh, and just do, sneak peek to the end. It's because of the justice of God. <laughs> but why? You know, why does that demonstrate the justice of God? We're going to talk about that a little bit today. And we're, so we're focused on the cross. We are. But before we, we answer that question, why did Jesus have to die? Or as we begin to answer that question and, and looking at the cross in the New Testament, we're going to go all the way back. I'm going to ask you to, to take a step back to the beginning of human history with me all the way back to Genesis. And Genesis starts with what? Who knows what Genesis starts with? Chapter 1, good answer. And verse 1 of chapter 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it, it goes on to outline uh, the, the process of creation that God went through. And he created this perfect world, this beautiful creation. In fact, it says he looked upon it, it says, and God saw that it was good. And part of that creation was man and woman, he created them, Adam and Eve. And, uh, sorry, if I bump this, I'm not used to wearing one of these, but uh, part of that creation was Adam and Eve. And the fact, they enjoyed a unique relationship with God. They walked with him. They talked with him. In fact, uh, which reminds me, last time I spoke to you all, was actually, if I remember right, it was Facebook Live because we had a snowstorm. It was back in the winter time, And I actually referenced an old hymn called In the Garden. And the chorus of that says, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And that's this re special relationship that Adam and Eve enjoyed with their heavenly father, that they, they communed with him in the garden, this beautiful garden of Eden that God created. They had this closeness to this relationship, this, this uh, uh, unbroken relationship with him that they enjoyed. And of all the beautiful creation that God established and gave them access to, he asked them to uh, refrain from one thing. They said, there's one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He says, don't eat the fruit of that tree. You can enjoy all the rest of it, but don't, don't eat of that one. Of course, we know how that story plays out, don't we? They did eat of the tree and sin entered the world. That this, this beautiful creation, sin-free creation that God established, Adam and Eve sinned. And like any man... Adam blamed it on his wife, of course. He said, God, you gave her to me. It's her fault. But don't we always do that? We, one, we blame our sin on other people. But when, when we're told not to, uh, not to do something, we find ourselves drawn to it, don't we? You, know, you got all of this beautiful creation, all of this fruit, all of this provision. There's one tree. Don't eat the fruit of that tree. Stay, don't even touch it. Stay away from that one. And of course, that's where their temptation lied. That's what they were drawn to. That's human nature, isn't it? We're drawn to the things that, we, that aren't good for us, that we shouldn't have. We're, we're, we have the sinful nature. In fact, if, um, if I were to tell you, there's a door right behind that light over there. Whatever you do, don't open that door. In fact, there's a lot of other doors in this building. Have at them. You can, you can look behind any door. Don't look behind that one. You don't want to see what's behind it. In fact, you're not going to be interested in that door. It's very uninteresting back there. You, 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 it, that's not going to matter to you. Don't open that door. You're probably already asking your neighbor, what do you think's behind that door? <laughs> it's our human nature. We're drawn to those things that, that probably aren't good for us, that we're told not to do. And Adam and Eve experienced that. They, they were given this perfect relationship with God, this communion with their heavenly Father, and yet they were drawn to the one thing that God told them to refrain from. And in so doing, they exchanged this, this intimate relationship with the Lord, this perfect communion with their heavenly Father for a life of exile. They were, they were uh, sent out of the garden. They, they exchanged life of provision and blessing for a life of hard work and toil. They, this is what they did. Their sin stepped them outside the blessing of God. God did not desire them to step outside the blessing. He didn't force them outside. They made a choice. They stepped outside the blessing of God. So that relationship that they so enjoyed was broken. It was fractured. 
And thankfully, that's not the end of the story. What, it didn't stop there. God set into motion an amazing plan of redemption that we see unfolding throughout human history. He made a, a way for that, that which had been broken, this relationship with God, to be restored. And this is this journey we see. In fact, the, the title of the series is Destined for the Cross. We see that beginning right there when sin entered the world, this plan of redemption that leads to the cross unfold throughout human history. And the Old Testament may seem a bit hard to understand at times. It may even seem a bit harsh. And let's be honest, there are some harsh stories in the Old Testament, aren't there? And yet, when I look at the Old Testament, as I've studied the Old Testament, I see a love story. I see the love of God on display, his, the love for his people. Even in the hard times, even in the, the difficult times, you know, when, the, when his people experience famine and need, when they experience defeat at the hands of the enemy, when they experience exile in, in Babylon or in Syria, they, uh, what that is is God using those circumstances to draw a people that had stepped outside of his blessing back into his blessing. Even these harsh stories are God's, part of God's plan of redemption. He desires that relationship be restored, and we see that unfolding throughout the Old Testament, this love story of God for his people. There's a lot to un, that could be unpacked about that topic, but that's not today's message. Today, we're talking about the justice of God, and, and we're going to talk about the, how the cross exemplifies the justice of God. And so that plan of redemption ultimately led to the cross. It led to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. As far as ways to die go, crucifix, crucifixion is pretty bad. It was not uh, a, a, a quick death. It was not an easy death. It was, uh, you know, in fact, scholars say it was uh, really a, a death by suffocation more than anything else. As the person that's being crucified, the weight of their body is being pulled down. It's hard for them even to grasp for breath. And as Jesus has experienced this on the cross, uh, trying to grasp for breath, we know that his hands and his feet were pierced. And perhaps, you know, he's pushing up on his feet that had been pierced on that spike, try, just grasping for breath, trying to get a breath in. And and understanding that in the midst of this, uh, he had been severely beaten prior to this. He had been scourged with the cat of nine tails that had ripped at the flesh of his back, probably exposing bones and organs. This is the condition he was in on the cross, struggling for breath, yet persevering through that pain. He makes seven statements on the cross fighting through even uh, gasping for breath, he makes significant statements there as he hung on the cross. And I want to look at those this morning uh, before we answer that question, why did Jesus have to die? Why is the justice of God demonstrated through the cross? Well, his, and you're going to see these passages up behind me. His first words as he's hanging there is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them for they know what, not what they do. You know, I don't know that I'd be saying that if I were hanging on the cross. I know I've experienced far less consequential situations, less painful situations, and often I'm thinking about my own, my own well-being, my own uh, comfort, uh, and I'm complaining and lamenting my situation. Jesus facing death, suffering, uh, the sins of the world being poured out upon him. And as he hangs there, he says, Father, forgive them. His concern is not for himself. His first thought is for those that put him there. Imagine that. His first thought was for those who were causing him to suffer such pain. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. His second words were to pardon a sinner, a criminal who was being crucified next to him. The criminal had said, Lord, remember me when, we, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I'll just keep going. They'll put, appear behind me as we keep going here. Uh, Jesus said, uh, assuredly, today you will be with me in paradise. So Jesus is there suffering, paying the price for something he didn't do. Here is a sinner, a criminal, who is facing punishment for something he did do. And so Jesus' first thought was for those that put him on the cross. His second statement is to the person, the, this, this criminal hanging next to him, who asked for mercy, for, asked just, Lord, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. So his first thought for those that put him on the cross, his second thought 
for a sinner. His second thought was, was grace, to extend grace and mercy to a criminal. The third thought, and this one, I think I'll get through this message without choking up today, but as I was studying and then preparing, there were several spots um, in this message that, that causes, caused me a bit of emotion. Um, so forgive me if I, if I do get choked up. I will do my best not to. But this one is particularly touching to me. His third thought, he's hanging there on the cross in this condition that we just described, having already been bloodied and beaten and his flesh torn, then he's nailed to a cross. And he's hang, as, as he's hanging there, after he makes a statement about those who put him on the cross and this criminal hanging next to him, he looks down and his mother is standing there. He sees his mom who is witnessing this, this traumatic event being played out before her eyes, her son being crucified on a cross. And his heart breaks for his mom. And he says, Mother, behold your son. Next to his mom was the disciple whom he loved, the apostle John. And he says, uh, Mother, behold, or woman, behold your son. His, first, his third thought was for the, the care and concern of his mom. She, even in his state, and the condition he's in, he's wanting to ensure his mom is being cared for and will be cared for. And he says to John, um, behold your mother. Woman, behold your son. And as it, with a nod to John as he's hanging on the cross, I don't know if he nodded, but I imagine, he, you know, acknowledging John said, behold your mother. So he, he formed this relationship. And the passage goes on to say that John took Mary, the mother of Jesus, into his home and it treated her as his own mother. So as he's hanging there, his heart breaks for his mom who's witnessing what he's enduring. And his fourth statement in uh, Matthew 27, 46, he cries out this appeal to his heavenly father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is, I don't know that, you know, the, the exact timing of things, but in my mind, I picture this is the moment, you know, his 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 perspective shifts from those around him to what he's going through. And I kind of imagine this is the moment that he felt the weight of the sins of the world. And he cries out in agony to his heavenly father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the culmination of that redemptive plan that we talked about that played out through thousands of years from the Garden of Eden fulfilled on the cross. The sins of the world poured out upon Jesus Christ, a man who knew no sin, uh, who was God himself, all fully God, fully man, the sins of the world poured out upon him. And he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? On the cross, the God, the father treated Jesus as if he had lived your life so that God could treat us as though we lived his perfect life. Think about that. On the cross, God treated this, his son, Jesus, as though he had lived our sinful life so he could treat us as though we had lived his perfect life. Think about that. This amazing transaction that took place on the cross, our sin, our shame, our guilt, exchanged for the righteousness of God. It's amazing. And that is the good news of the gospel. That is the good news of Jesus Christ. And then in his first statement, we see a moment of his humanity. As I said, he was fully God, but he was fully man. And we see his humanity in this fifth statement. He simply says two words. He says, I thirst. I thirst. This is God hanging on the cross. He could have called down a legion of angels to rescue him from the situation if he had chose. He could have called forth a river of water to quench his thirst had he so chose. But he simply says, I thirst. We see his humanity. He's the creator of the world. The, the, he is God the Son. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. This is the Son. He, he Being fully God, he had all the rights and privileges of deity except on the cross and throughout his life, uh, he never for, performed miracles for his own benefit. He always performed miracles for the benefits of others. He never performed miracles for his personal benefit, his personal gain. He always did it for the benefit and the blessing of others. That is his example to us. He, this is God made flesh come not as, a, as, as a, an earthly king desiring that everybody bend a knee, but he came as a servant. 
And we see this exemplified in the simple statement, his humanity in the simple statement, I thirst. His sixth statement in John 19, 30. Uh, this la- the last one, it, I thirst, two words. The third one's three words. It is finished. It is finished. The thir- the, these th- this three-word statement, the sixth statement he made while hanging on the cross. In the original language, it is finished. In the Greek, is translated to telestai, to telestai, which meant complete, uh, finished, paid in full. The debt has been paid. Nothing more is owed. So he said, it is finished. He didn't say, I am finished. This wasn't an acknowledgement that his life had come to an end. It was an acknowledgement that, that a work had been completed. It is finished. What was finished? The work that the Father had given him to do. There was being a son, even God the Son, he submitted to the will of his heavenly Father. God the Son submitted to the will of God the Father. And that will led him to the cross, to the situation he found himself in. With the weight of the sin on him, he says the work has been complete. He completed the work the Father had given him to do. Finished were the sufferings of Christ. Finished uh, was payment for the sins of the world. Never again would he even for a moment be forsaken by his heavenly Father. We heard him cry out a moment ago, God, for, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But never again would he feel being forsaken by his Father. The work had been done. Through death, Christ destroyed him who had the power of death, who is the devil, it says in Hebrews chapter 2. Death was defeated at the cross and through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Death was defeated when Christ arose. The work was complete, made complete at the cross. Because of that work, we have freedom. We have not only freedom from death in eternal life, but freedom from, from sin's power in this life. No longer are we slaves to sin. No longer are we slaves to, to the things that plague us in this life, to sickness, to, to mental illness. God has bought and purchased our freedom, and we have that freedom because of Jesus' sacrifice at Calvary. And he finished our salvation. It's done. It's paid for. The debt has been paid to Telestai. Uh, and I, th- I told this story uh, to somebody just recently, a group from Ridgeline. I don't think I've ever told it. Uh, up from up here on the platform, but uh, years ago, well, 22 years ago, and just before Kim and I got married, uh, we were looking to move into an apartment, and by the way, out in California, where we come from, when you move into a new place, you have to buy a fri- refrigerator. I guess that's not a thing out here, that when you buy a place, you get a refrigerator. We didn't have that luxury out in California, and uh, being uh, early 20s, we, we didn't have a lot of money and to, to furnish and buy all the uh, appliances we needed. So my dad said, uh, we're, we're going to buy you a, f- a refrigerator. And he, my dad was a missionary. He used to travel overseas a lot. So he was out of the country, but he told my mom, take him shopping, let him pick out a refrigerator. And, and, here, and he told me what the limit was. I can't remember what that limit, that price limit was off the top of my head. But he, um, he gave some instructions. So my mom took us shopping. We picked out a refrigerator. And of course, uh, probably because what I said earlier, we're kind of drawn to what we can't have. We picked out a refrigerator that was more expensive than <laughs> that, that limit he had given us. So uh, being the negotiator I am, I said, well, mom, why don't you buy the refrigerator and then we'll pay you back. We'll pay the difference uh, between what dad said you, you can pay and, and what the cost of the refrigerator is. So she goes, okay, I'll, I'll, we'll do that. And so uh, that day after we got home, I, uh, I, I wrote out a check. That's another thing we used to do 20 years ago. We used to write checks. So for, for you kids in here, that's a paper that you know, has an account number on it, represents the actual money that's in your bank. But uh, again, that's a lesson for another time. But, <laughs> but I actually wrote a check to my dad, Ray Castro. The amount was the difference in what he said he would pay and what the fridge actually cost. And I put that in an envelope. Again, this is how we used to send money. We used to put a check in an envelope and actually put it in a mailbox. Somebody would pick it up and deliver it to, can you imagine that? Now we just, exactly. Yeah. You know, now we just get out our phone and money is instantly transferred. But I mailed a check to him. I didn't hear anything back. And a week or so later, uh, maybe a couple weeks later, I get an envelope in the mail from him, and I open it up, and all that's in it is the check that I had sent him, and the word written across the check was tetelestai. That Greek word, 
that is translated in our English New Testament, it is finished or the debt has been paid. What he was saying was, uh, it's paid in full. You don't owe anything. You know, and you know, that's a silly example of a debt being paid, but a more consequential, the most consequential example is Christ's sacrifice for us on the cross. The debt has been paid because of what he did. He said, it is finished, to telestai. Nothing more is owed. Just like if I, uh, you know, my dad, not that he would, but if he ever said, hey, remember that, uh, that refrigerator I bought you? I think you owe me a little bit of money for it. I could say, nope, I got this check right here. It says, to telestai, paid in full, right on it. You know, nobody could ever claim that I owed my dad money because the debt had been paid. And so we can no longer be accused of owing a debt because of what Jesus did. He paid the price for our sin. Finally, he gave a seventh and final statement as he lay there or hang there on the cross. Luke 23 says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And with that, Jesus died the way he lived in submission to the will of his heavenly father, knowing that his heavenly father loved him very much, cared for him, and had a plan for him. And he submitted to that. Father, into your hands. I commit my spirit, total surrender to the will of his Father. And we're going to get to the why that had to happen in just a moment. But I think these seven statements that we, we just read on screen have significant application to our life. In those seven statements, we, see, we gain insight into Jesus' attitude as he hung there on the cross, as he bear, bore the weight of the sins of the world we see his mentality, where his thinking was. We see his heart through these seven statements. And I think, you know, as I pondered that, I started thinking, I hope I die with such an attitude. And then I started thinking, actually, I hope I live with such an attitude. I hope it's not something I wait to till I'm on my deathbed to ponder. But I hope I embrace this attitude of Jesus as I live my life, as I go about my days. Some things to consider when he said, Father, forgive them, his first thought was towards forgiveness for those who had wronged him. Who do we need to forgive? Who do you need to forgive this morning? Where is reconciliation needed? And maybe that forgiveness is for somebody that, that, that you don't even have communication or contact with, and there's no way to communicate with them, but simply in your spirit before the Lord, you need to forgive somebody for something that they've done to you. Who do you need to receive forgiveness from? Sometimes that's even harder, receiving forgiveness. But his first thought went to forgiveness. Who do we need to forgive? Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, he says, Be tenderhearted, forgiving one another. I think I have a different translation, by the way. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ forgave you. By the way, I study in a different translation than typically the NIV I put on the screen. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Even in his pain, he was compassionate. He expressed mercy to those who had put him on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. Who do we need to forgive? Just as Christ has forgiven us. Second, to the thief, today you will be with me in paradise. The, who needs to hear the gospel from you? Who do you need to invite into relationship with God so they can experience the grace and the mercy of a loving Heavenly Father? Who in your life you know, in my notes, I actually had the question, does anyone need to hear the gospel from you? But the answer to that question is yes. We are all at the center of a network of relationship. God has put us in the middle of a network of relationships. Our, our neighborhood, our family, our coworkers, the, the, the people that serve us at the restaurants we frequent, uh, we're at, all at the center of a network of relationships. And God desires that we proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ within that network. Who needs to hear the gospel from you? Uh, consider that. Pray about that. And Nathan has been challenging us as we led up to Easter to, uh, to pray over our neighborhoods. And I think you'll be hearing more about that from him. But be prayerful about how you can be a missionary to your neighborhood. Who needs to hear the gospel from you? And then third, he, his thoughts went to his mom again. Woman, behold your son. Who needs, who needs you to take care of them? Just as Jesus, in the midst of a traumatic situation, a painful situation, his thought was for care and concern for somebody that had relied on him. Who needs your care and concern? Who can you provide for? Who can you bless in this life? 
consider who, how you could be a blessing to those around you. Fourth, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because Jesus suffered that separation, we don't have to. So I hope I live my life in such a way that I'm acknowledging that because Jesus suffered in my, in my, uh, my stead, I get to enjoy a communion with the Heavenly Father, unbroken, unfractured because of what Jesus did for me. So whatever you're facing today, you can, rem- you can know for certain, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that you don't face that alone. Because of what Christ did for us, we are not separated from God. We don't have to fear separation from God, but we can live in confidence that no matter what we endure, we endure with God sustaining and providing for us. He carries us through those difficult situations because of what Christ did for us on the cross. The, uh, I think the fifth application, that statement, I thirst, it's a simple one. Accept help when it's offered. Sometimes that's hard. I'll, I'll admit for me, sometimes it's hard for me to accept help. It's even harder for me to ask for help. You know, I, I, I'm the guy that when people say, how are you doing? I'm, saying, I'm doing great. I'm doing fine. Sometimes I'm not doing fine. Jesus said, I thirst. And they wetted a sponge and lifted it up and gave him a sip. Sometimes... We need to accept help when it's offered. Jesus modeled his humanity in that moment. I thirst, and he was given a drink. Accept help when it's offered to you. Sixth, he said, it is finished. We can rest in the finished work of Christ on the cross. We anticipate the glory of heaven because of what Jesus did on the cross. We can be certain that no matter what we face in this life, it's temporary. And eventually this life will give way to the glory of perfect communion once again with our heavenly father. Finally, Jesus says, into your hands, Lord, I commit my spirit. It reminds me of Stephen. Remember Stephen in the New Testament? He was the first martyr. And he said something similar. He said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Receive my spirit in Acts chapter seven. And in that moment, his eyes were open and and he was given a glimpse of heaven. And it says um, in Uh, that he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father in this moment where he's being stoned, Stephen, the martyr, is being stoned. He's getting ready to pass from this life to the next. He says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He's given this glimpse of heaven, and Jesus is standing at the right hand of the Father. He says, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, this is unique, I think, maybe not, But I think this is unique because all the other images we have of Jesus in heaven, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. In this instance, he's standing at the right hand of the Father. Now, I don't have any deep theological rationale for why Stephen sees him standing rather than sitting, as we see in other parts of Scripture. But I remember, I heard a pastor uh, share once his opinion, and that's all this is, is an opinion. Again, no biblical uh, opinion. Uh, rationale for this, but I love the the thought, and I hope it'll be a blessing to you too. But he said, this pastor said, he believed the reason why he saw Jesus standing rather than sitting at the right hand of the Father is because Jesus was standing in honor of the first martyr. He was saying, come home, welcome home, I'm here. And, uh, you know, just that, that image, you know, of of Stephen in this moment where he's being stoned, you know, Jesus, when he's being crucified, Lord, and Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Stephen's saying, Jesus, uh, receive my spirit. And in that moment, he sees Jesus standing at the right hand. Can you imagine Jesus standing with arms open and welcoming you home? You know, that's what we have to look forward. That's what we anticipate is the glory of heaven. This, our heavenly Father, our, the Son, Uh, welcoming us home after this life. We ultimately all will pass from this life into the next. And I got got a secret for you. The next one is a whole lot better than this one. As much as we get to experience uh, God's faithfulness, his provision, his joy, his peace in this life, in the next, it's much greater. We get unbroken relationship with our heavenly father. Come home, son, I'm waiting for you. We don't have to be afraid no matter what we face in this life because we know what awaits us. And that day will come for all of us. 
when it's time to transition from this life to the next, but we have the glory of heaven to anticipate, to look forward to. Well, the title of the message is The Justice of God. And I think I might have said a, a subtitle might be, Why Did Jesus Have to Die? Why Did Jesus Have to Die on the Cross? So let me answer that for you, at least my opinion. And it's, it's probably not a comprehensive uh, answer. So I'll give you four things that, that I, I think. Um, but there's probably other things that I could add to this list. But as I see on the timer, I'm already out of time. The first reason Jesus had to die on the cross, he suffered and died to show his love for us. He suffered and died to show his love for us. Don't ever doubt that God loves you. Some, and sometimes, logically, uh, I understand that God loves me. I know what the word says. I believe the word is, is God's word to us. I don't question that. You know, so, so sometimes in my brain, I, I, I acknowledge, yes, God loves me. Sometimes in my behavior and in my heart, my emotions, sometimes I may not feel like that. Sometimes I might question when I'm going through tough times, you know, where is God in that? But don't ever question whether God loves you. He demonstrated his love for you on the cross. You know, it wasn't nails. It wasn't spikes that held Jesus on the cross. It was his love for you. It was his love for me. His love held him on the cross. He endured the cross because of his love for us. He willingly received onto his shoulders the sins of the world because of his love for us. John three sixteen, that familiar passage, for God so loved the world. By the way, I memorized it, King James Version. But for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. For God so loved you. For God so loved me that he gave his life for us. It was his love that held him on the cross. In Ephesians 5, 25 says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That is Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. And then when he wrote uh, Galatians, he, Paul personalizes this statement. And he says that God loved me and gave himself for me in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And yeah, I live by faith in the Son of Man, who God loved me and gave himself for me. So you can personalize that statement. Yeah, Christ loves the church, gave himself for her. But we can personalize, God loves you and gave himself for you. God loves me, gave himself for me. That's the love of Jesus. Jesus suffered and died on the cross because he loves us. His love for us was demonstrated on the cross. Second, Jesus suffered and died to absorb the wrath of God. He suffered and died to absorb the wrath of God. We offended God, and not just we in this building, we as humanity, we offended God. We sinned against him. We, you know, we've, there's this line, just like Adam and Eve in the garden, God said, you can do all of this, but don't do that. He made a line. There's a line for us, and we've continually crossed that line over and over and over again, and we still do. We're not perfect, even after we've surrendered our lives to Christ. But we've sinned against God. We've crossed the line. And Jesus died, took our place. He took the judgment upon himself that we should have bore. He took our judgment upon himself. He suffered and died to absorb the wrath of God. Third, Jesus suffered and died to cancel the legal demands against us. There is no salvation in balancing records. There's no salvation. In, if you remember anything, remember that. Because well, most of you probably know, I work for an organization called Evangelism Explosion. And the term evangelism is right there in our name. And I've had a chance to minister all throughout the United States, all around the world. And often as I minister to people, as I preach the gospel, uh, I'll ask people a series of questions. And one of those questions is, suppose you were to die, stand before God, and he asked you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? What would you tell him if God said, why should I let you into heaven? Now, that's a question for us to consider. God wouldn't ask us that question. He knows our hearts. But it gets people thinking. And more often than not, the answer I get to that question is some form of, I hope my good outweighs my bad. As though we can balance the scales or if we're super optimistic, tilt the scale in our favor a little bit, that our good outweighs our bad. Oftentimes when I, and really that question, what would you tell God? That's really getting to the, the, uh, the heart of what are we trusting in for salvation? Are we trusting in Jesus or are we trusting in our own efforts? And when we say, well, I hope my good outweighs my bad, 
We're trusting in ourselves. We're trusting our own efforts to get us into heaven. But there's no salvation in balancing scales. There's only salvation in the canceling of records. And our debt was wiped clean when Jesus paid the price on the cross. Our debt was wiped clean. There's no salvation in balancing records, only in canceling records. And our sinful record was wiped clean through what Jesus did on the cross. He took our punishment upon himself. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14 says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt, canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He nailed our sin to the cross. We had a legal demand that was wiped clean. Jesus suffered and died. So that third point, Jesus suffered and died to cancel the legal demands against us. And fourth, and my final answer today for why Jesus had to die, Jesus suffered and died to provide forgiveness and justification. Yes, he forgave us our sins. That debt was made clean, made whole. It was canceled, but we've also been justified. It's though, if you think in terms of a bank balance, say this line here is zero, and, but we find ourselves in debt to the bank. You know, we're below zero. Well, th- what Jesus did with our sin, he brought that debt to zero. He canceled the debt, but more than that, he credited us justification. We've, we've been forgiven our sin, and we've been given the righteousness of Jesus. Imagine that. We've been forgiven our sin, our, our debt zeroed out, but on top of that, been credited justification. So he died on the, and suffered on the cross and rose again to provide forgiveness and justification. Your, his righteousness has been credited to your account. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. It is finished. It is complete. It is done. Nothing else has to be paid. You know, that question I mentioned a little bit ago, what would we tell God if he asked why we, he should let us into heaven? Even people that I know have been a Christian for years and years often struggle to answer that question because our human nature is we have to do something. We have to pay something. We have to earn it. We have to deserve it, but we can't. And Nathan reminded us about that last week. We can't earn or deserve heaven. It's only through what Jesus did on the cross. And Jesus had to suffer those things because we serve a righteous, a holy, and a just God. There was a debt that needed to be paid. If God ignored the debt, then he wouldn't be a just God. If he let the debt go unpaid, he wouldn't be a just God. If somebody broke into your house and robbed your house and they were caught and arrested and taken to court and the judge said, you know what, you're a good guy, you know, we're not going to do anything. Go, you go ahead, let him go, police. Uh, let's let him go free. We'll, we'll let him off this time. Uh, would that be a just judge if they let somebody who committed a crime go free without any consequence? No. Well, if an earthly judge has a standard of, of justice to uphold, imagine how much more so our Heavenly Father, who's holy and righteous, has a standard of justice to maintain. If he didn't ignore the debt, if the debt didn't, wasn't paid, he would not be a just God. And if he was not a just God, he would not be a righteous and holy God. But he is a righteous and holy God. And justice needed to be made. And justice was carried out through Christ's life, his death, and his resurrection. His action on the cross paid the penalty. So if you, maybe that question's sticking with you a little bit this morning. But I asked... Uh, God would ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? What do you think about when you look, think about the end of this life? Because that's a reality that we all face at some point. This is a temporary life. These days we've been given to walk on earth are temporary. And that someday they will come to an end. And when you think about that, do you look forward to the, the end of those days with, with a hopeful anticipation? Do you look towards those days with fear and anxiety? Well, if you've not entered into a relationship with Jesus, if you've not surrendered your life to him, then there is reason to be concerned about what is next after this life is through. For those of us that that know Christ, there is 
uh, a tension between the, the joy and purpose in this life and what lies ahead. Paul said, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. While we're here, we've been given a mission. We've been given a purpose. We get to glorify God and fulfill the purpose that he has for us in this life. He's given us a ministry. Yet, we look forward to that day where we're ushered into his presence. To live is Christ, but to die is gain. But if you're not so sure yet if to die is gain for you, whether you're here in this auditorium this morning, whether you're watching online, I would plead with you this morning. I would plead with you this morning. Don't let this day go by. Don't let this moment go by without embracing the assurance of eternal life that comes through, only comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a surrendering of faith and trust in ourselves and our own efforts and placing our faith in what Jesus did on the cross for us. His death and his resurrection paid the penalty for our sins, but sometimes we go on trying to pay that bill on our own, and that's a futile effort. We can't do it. We can't pay that price on our own. Don't let this moment go by without surrendering your life to Jesus, without receiving the blessing, the forgiveness, the righteousness that comes through relationship with Christ. As we close, if you'll bow your heads and close your eyes with me, we're going to close in prayer here in just a moment. But as we do, prayerfully search your heart. Where are you at in your relationship with Christ? Maybe you would say, I've never given my life to Christ before. I need that. I need that hope that you talked about this morning. I need that assurance that you talked about this morning. If that's you, would you raise your hand this morning? And even if you're online, if that's you, just make that profession wherever you're sitting this morning. I need a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you would say that, you know what, I gave my life to Jesus, but I've taken his sacrifice for granted. I need to rededicate myself to a relationship with him and to his purpose in my life. I need to pursue what he has for me. If you want to rededicate your life to Christ this morning, would you raise your hand? I'm just going to pray with all of us. And again, if you're online, I can't see your hands, obviously, but just profess in your heart that you want that to rededicate your life, yourself, to Jesus the plans and the purposes that he has for you. Let's pray.